Well, thank you. I'm really delighted to be, be here in Canada. I was almost Canadian. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> you know, the, uh, that's a small town. It's smaller than it used to be, I might add. You know, I remember as a kid, we used to, you know, we had four TV stations, which was more than most of the U.S., and the, the only one that actually worked was CBC, so. <laughs> but the shows worked. <laughs> no, but, but at any rate, uh, you know, I, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, the, what, what I do now, but also I'm going to end with a few comments about small satellites, because uh, uh, I think uh, it, I've been a sellout for small satellites <clears throat> for a long time. Uh, but let me start by my sponsors. And uh, used to be when I worked for the government, I'd have to show a picture of you know, the U.S. Or, U.S. Congress and so on, but, but we have a smaller group of sponsors, and uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're all about, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, these folks, you might have heard of some of them, uh, they have more money than I do, uh, <laughs> but just to kind of go through the, the Breakthrough Prize Foundation sponsors, uh, uh, there's uh, Ann Wiki and Sergey Brin. Former husband and wife, uh, but Sergey is one of the co founders of Google, if you don't remember. And Anne is uh, uh, the founder of 23andMe. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, Yuri Milner, who's our principal sponsor. He's uh, an investor, uh, uh, originally from Russia. In fact, as a retired Air Force general, I never thought I'd be working for a Russian guy. <laughs> uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you might have heard of him too. Uh, he runs a small company uh, that uh, is up the road from where I used to work. Uh, and then Jack Ma, who's the chairman of Alibaba, uh, the, one of the largest companies in China. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, these folks, uh, um, starting with Jerry Milner about five years ago, were looking at lists of, of who the most famous people on earth. Uh, and uh, one list is you know who gets noted the most on Facebook and the other social media. Uh, and it turns out that there's only one scientist uh, alive today that Stephen Hawking. Uh, by the way, we're working with Stephen, so he's a group of name uh, But uh, uh, if you look at the 100 most famous people on most lists, uh, you see very few scientists. And uh, uh, this is a concern. Uh, it's a concern because these people made their wealth based on technology. <coughs> technology is based on science. Uh, so uh, about five years ago, they decided to do the Breakthrough Prize, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but we give out $24 million of prize money. It's the biggest prize in science, it's Academy Awards of Science, much bigger than that little small prize they give in Stockholm. Uh, <laughs> you might have been happy with either of them. But I'll talk a little bit about those, but you know, one of the things, speaking of science, this is a really neat year. This is the 100th anniversary of, of Einstein's general relativity paper. Uh, perhaps the most seminal paper of all time. Uh, the, uh, uh, so I think, you know, and, and, and I put this up for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, this is the equation just to show that I did go to a technical graduate school. Uh, <laughs> although I have to confess that I took a general relativity course and flunked out. It's really hard. <laughs> this is supposedly the general relativity equation, but there's about 18 levels behind it of matrices and so on. That you know, like some people like me can't figure out. Uh, and, and, and I also put this up for a reason that uh, uh, one of the prizes that we started giving last year, and I'm going to show a little short clip here in a second, uh, is the uh, junior breakthrough prize, where we ask uh, high school kids around the world to. Uh, they give a little 10-minute video on, uh, on some principle of science. Uh, the, uh, it's a pretty good prize that we give the, the young, young person a uh, $250,000 scholarship. Uh, uh, the school gets $100,000 laboratory, and the school's for the teacher. This is the cool one. gets a $50,000 check. So be nice to your students. <laughs> uh, the teacher for this kit, by the way, is, uh, Brian Chester, I'll show you in a second. 
didn't even know he was nominated. And so when he got a call and said, oh, by the way, where do we send your check? It's kind of like, what? <laughs> that kid actually. But uh, anyhow, this is, a, this is a short introduction about special relativity. This, this Almost kid everyone has heard of Einstein's special theory of relativity. It was truly groundbreaking. But it doesn't have to be complicated or hard to understand. In fact, I bet we could formulate it ourselves. The theory had two postulates, or parts. The first one said simply that the laws of physics are the same in any inertial reference frame. A reference frame is just what a person considers to be at rest. I say considers because you can also consider it to be in motion relative to something else in the universe. Wow, it sounds like we're developing a theory of relativity. So Einstein said that the laws of physics are identical in any inertial reference frame, meaning one that isn't speeding up or slowing down. But why does the speed have to be constant? Well, that's easy to prove. Just sit in a chair, grab a bowl of popcorn, place it in front of you, sit back, and watch how the laws of physics behave. Hmm, nothing's happening. Now let's do the same thing in the car with the windows blacked out. What if the driver decides to change the speed of the car drastically by stopping all of a sudden? All of a sudden, the laws of physics seem to act a bit differently. What if the car travels at a nice constant speed? Then the exact same thing happens as when I was just sitting on the earth. Nothing. In both the reference frame of the earth and the car, the popcorn doesn't move. Both the earth and car were moving at different speeds, but as far as I can tell, the laws of physics acted exactly the same. Thus, we can conclude the same thing would have happened in any frame of reference that was also moving at a constant speed. And none of them would have been any less valid than any of the others. So there you have it. You just proved the first postulate. Okay, well, there's another eight or nine minutes of that. Uh, he goes on to actually start to get into general relativity. It's a pretty smart kid. Uh, but I, I do want to urge everybody to, to, to you got, you know, high school kids, uh, uh, this will be an announcement pretty soon. Uh, you know, it's all online stuff, 10 minute video. Uh, pretty good deal. Well, let me go back to Einstein. Uh, as I said, I was not a theorist, and uh, manifestly so, but. Uh, there's an observationist here. This is uh, Sir Arthur Eddington uh, with Einstein. Uh, uh, and Eddington actually proved the, 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 that some of Einstein's predictions were correct. In 1919, he took telescopes, which is what I do know something about, uh, you know, look in the small end and see if things are big. Uh, yeah, I can do what that kid did, too. Uh, but, uh, uh, he took these to the 1919 eclipse. One of Einstein's <coughs> predictions that starlight will be bent by strong gravitational fields. Uh, and, and I'll come back to this later <coughs> talk. But uh, this is the actual data uh, that during an eclipse, you can see stars near the sun. Uh, and he, at Eddington, was able to measure a small shift. Uh, you can sort of see in the red here the small shift. Uh, there was quite an argument about this for a while that people said Eddington didn't do the measurements right, but in fact he did. Uh, but uh, this was the Proof uh, in 1919 of the general theory of relativity. So, pretty cool stuff. Uh, and but, but hold that thought about light bending. Now, let me go back to the breakthrough prize. Uh, but as I said, we're, our idea is that to make scientists as famous as we do movie stars. Uh, so, we have Vanity Fair, which does the Oscar party, uh, something that scientists usually don't get invited to. Uh, but, uh, or engineers either, if you don't see But uh, uh, we just, uh, the, the, the foundation decided to make, change that. So uh, they set up the Breakthrough Prize party, which is a huge ceremony. And they decided to do it someplace really cool. And, uh, you know, it was everybody in NASA knows the coolest place was NASA Ames. Uh, they've got a few other goofy centers too. JPL, I think. <laughs> Stands for just home hockey. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the director I said that. <laughs> but, uh, but this is the hangar one at the uh, Research Department. And uh, uh, the, uh, we've had the 
the ceremony there for three years. It's a really cool ceremony. Uh, it's the only black tie affair in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, here's the prize. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the prize is up right there. <laughs> but uh, this is Christine Aguilera, uh, who probably most people know. And uh, so the idea we invite a bunch of movie stars. She's been the entertainer for this. Uh, uh, I used to show pictures of her with some of our sponsors, but I got asked not to do that anymore because their spouses were concerned. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, uh, this is a $3 million prize. There are eight of them we give out. Uh, six of them biological sciences, and one in physics, and one in mathematics. Uh, Seth MacFarlane was our MC last year. Uh, uh, it's a really, really cool event. Uh, here you can see uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, the, uh, Helen Hobbs, who was one of the recipients who did a really neat, uh, identified some uh, genetic markers for uh, heart disease and uh, means to cure that. And then there's that young kid there that uh, had some money. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a really fun event, and it's beginning to really take off. Uh, and by the way, the nominations on this are online. Uh, I'll give you my name. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, this is where the, the, the prize is chosen by the uh, previous winners, uh, so it's different than, you know, we have a mysterious committee. Uh, but uh, we're going to keep this up. We think uh, this is really going to help get scientists to be uh, really famous. Uh, let me now turn to science. Uh, the, this is the Kepler mission. Uh, it, it was a jointly developed mission by JPL and, and Ames. Uh, that you're probably all familiar with it. Uh, uh, it looked for planets around a, a set of solar type stars by looking for the small motion for the small decrease in light. Uh, if you happen to have a pitch on the solar system, when the planet came from the star, a star like the, uh, the Sun with a planet like the Earth that's about 30 parts per million, so quite a limited detection. Uh, the mission was designed to last for four years. It lasted for four years in one day. Uh, so a well-designed mission. <laughs> Remember that. Uh, it had, at that point, it had two reaction wheels failed, but it's been resurrected by, by, by using something that Einstein talked about, radiation pressure, to, to stabilize the, the other direction. Uh, but anyway, a very successful mission uh, for, for, for us. I think the most important thing is that it's finding lots of planets, uh, in fact, effectively all stars in the galaxy, so sort of 100 billion stars, have, have planets uh, uh, around them, and probably about a quarter you know, uh, have a planet the size of the Earth in the habitable zone, which is where liquid water would exist. This is a couple of some of the planets that have been discovered. Uh, by the way, just you always need to ask scientists about their definition. Uh, I saw a chart when, the, when, I was, when I was the director of Ames of the habitable zone. They had a little blue dot just outside of it. I said, what's that? And they said, that's the Earth. <laughs> I said, the Earth is outside the habitable zone. <laughs> well, by our definition, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, that was fixed. <laughs> See, there's something called greenhouse effect. I'm not supposed to mention that, but it's... Uh, but, but anyway, uh, that's a lot. And so it really raises the issue of life in the universe, and particularly intelligent life. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about Breakthrough Initiative, which are another part of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation uh, that uh, we've announced a couple. We're considering other ones. Uh, but uh, the, ones, the first one we announced was uh, Breakthrough Listen. Uh, this is Yuri Milner and uh, the other guy, uh, Professor Hawking. And uh, July 20th, uh, we announced in London, the Royal Society, a uh, $100 million program uh, to revitalize our SETI search. A uh, really, really neat program uh, called Breakthrough Listen. The, uh, uh, we leased time on the world, some of the world's largest radio telescopes. Uh, this is the Green Bank Radio Telescope. Uh, we began uh, this year. Uh, we have about 20% of the time for a focused search on nearest stars, uh, the, uh, the plane of the galaxy, uh, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the nearest galaxies to look for intelligent signals. 
the reason we're doing this, we think we've got a, a bigger problem, possibility of success, is what we can go through a much broader band than in the past. But we also can use modern IT techniques and technologies. We think we have a 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth greater sensitivity. Um, this is Parkes radio telescope. It's the largest radio telescope in the southern hemisphere uh, for now. And uh, uh, we have 20% of the time on it. To, by the way, any, anybody wants to see a quintessentially Australian uh, movie, uh, go see The Dish. It was uh, filmed about a decade ago. It's about the Apollo program. Really cool that uh, they play cricket in The Dish. Um, I got a ride in The Dish. It was really cool. Uh, of course, we communicate increasingly in other wavelengths, like optical wavelengths. So we have uh, about 15% of the time on this telescope. It's a 2.4 meter at Lick Observatory. Uh, for an optical steady search, um, that uh, really cool thing. Uh, we are looking at other telescopes. This is Arecibo, the currently world's largest radio telescope. But we're in discussions with them about using this radio telescope. Uh, and this is the 500 meter uh, in China, which is complete, uh, nearing completion this year. We ex expect to have discussions with the, the Chinese about using it. We are truly trying to be a global uh, foundation. Uh, so if there's an alien signal, being dense. Uh, I want to make that, you know, that, that uh, we think that we got a good chance of seeing it uh, uh, in the next few years. Now, uh, what if we found it? So people want to send something back, right? Probably. Uh, that's an argument, by the way. Some people don't want to send anything back. Right? Uh, but we thought it would be useful at least to get people to think about it. And so we have a contest. We will announce the rules for in uh, sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, called Breakthrough Message. There'll be a $1 million worth of prize uh, to look at both creative aspects of what's an image, for example, that represents all the people on Earth, uh, and how do you transmit it. Uh, so stay tuned for the details of this. Uh, this is the first message that was actually transmitted. Uh, it was uh, made by Carl Sagan Front Break, so the originators of the whole SETI idea. Uh, it was actually transmitted, I think it was the M13, the collaborator cluster, about 25,000 light years away, so we haven't received a message back yet. Uh, a little bit longer to wait. But uh, that's one of the, the virtues if you receive a message, it's a long ways away. Think about it for a while. Uh, but I, I, I want to emphasize with our contest that we're not transmitting anything. Anybody that's a political person or anything else not transmitting, we just want to see what we would say. Now, uh, I mentioned the gravitation, or, you know, the gravitational starlight bending, and I put this picture up for a reason. Uh, it turns out that if you can get, and this is a challenge, if you can get to 550 astronomical units from the sun, and remember that the Voyager probes are only about 130 kg power, uh, the sun actually acts as a gravitational lens using Einstein's theory. Uh, that uh, there's been some work done by the uh, KISS group in, in Southern California that showed that, uh, that if you put a relatively modest spacecraft there, a small sat, that's why, uh, that uh, we, could, we could potentially uh, image so that you know, one of these planets that, that uh, you find that you might be able to get an image that uh, sort of looks like this. Uh, you know, this is hard, uh, but this is a, an area that I I think the community, the, the scientific community and the, and the space community, this is a challenge that we can do, I think, in the next few decades. And uh, got to think about how to do it and clearly about small satellites. Uh, so that's a, that's a challenge that, that I have a personal interest in. Now, uh, uh, my real interest, you know, I won't say that all these billionaires that we're working on, uh, is uh, this is the solar neighborhood. You know, not this silly little solar system. <coughs> Space agencies are fiddling with. I think this is the century that we need to start considering uh, the nearby stars. And uh, what's there? Uh, is there life there? Uh, maybe even intelligent life? Uh, and uh, is it possible to potentially, this century, maybe send something there? Uh, the uh, first step, obviously, is to see if there's a life bearing planet. Uh, can we image a pale blue dot uh, around the nearest, uh, uh, nearest stars? Uh, this is a chart uh, done by a, one of 
Gaines got this, uh, and I won't go through the details, but it actually shows that, that some of the nearest stars, particularly Alpha Centauri, uh, which is an <coughs> interesting star system, several more of its at the moment, uh, you could, with a small satellite, to you know, like a 30 centimeter, 40 centimeter aperture, <coughs> image a planet the size of the Earth and have it. So this is a very interesting effort, uh, and uh, it's one I think that the small satellite community ought to seriously look at. Uh, this is uh, the nearest star, I said, Alpha Centauri system. It's uh, kind of statistically unlikely, given that most stars in the galaxy are little, little small red ones, tenth the mass of the sun, <coughs> that the nearest star system actually has two solar type stars. Uh, one's a little bigger than the sun, one's a little bit smaller. Uh, they are uh, slightly older than the sun. The, 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 the smaller one, there's arguably a planet and detected around it by its radio velocity and reflex motion. Uh, they are. Uh, and there's a third star in it, which is a little tiny one, approximately the same. Uh, interesting system. Uh, that uh, could there be a life bearing planet? Could there be a <laughs> species there? That's, that's a big question. Uh, this is a mission that NASA Ames proposed that didn't get accepted. Uh, NASA headquarters. Uh, I love NASA. <laughs> but, uh, I know they're NASA's chill, so. Uh, but no, that's it. But uh, uh, this this is a, a about a thirty seven year mission, so uh, I get to challenge the community and the space agencies around the world to consider this kind of. Uh, Bob, satellites, and, see I do love NASA, the, uh, the one guy there is a NASA administrator, one's not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, the guy that is the NASA administrator, Charlie Bolin, has in his hand is a, is a I guess they call it a Fenway stack. Uh, and the other guy is Zach Manchester who developed that. Uh, this is a satellite on a chip, this weighed four grams. And, uh, uh, he tried to launch it uh, a year ago, uh, 100 of them uh, off CubeSat. Uh, it was privately funded through a kick, Kickstarter campaign, I think it was called Kickstarter, uh, through a lot of reasons that didn't work, but they're going to try this again. But uh, this is the kind of thing, I think, that begins to give us access to these places that are, that are uh, like the gravity lens point in interstellar space. So, uh, I haven't heard a lot of discussion yet about these things, but I think this is the future. So I really look forward to people looking at it. Uh, I'd like to kind of close here with this quote by Stephen Hawking. Uh, I think it really represents the, what we're all about is that uh, uh, you know, we're human and uh, we need to know. So uh, I will stop there. I think we have time for questions or whatever, but uh, thank you for inviting me and, and Godspeed to all. Six. Why so heavily towards biology? Well, a lot of it has to do with sponsors. Uh, you, you know, biology is kind of interesting. I mean, since we're biological, and a lot of people are interested in aging, especially when they get my age. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, it's a, it's a natural thing. But, but it, there's a second reason. I, I, a lot of the frontiers now, I mean, the, the questions. I, I, the last century of my age was the century of physics. And, and, and aerospace. Uh, this century, arguably, is a century for bi biology. I mean, that some of the fundamental questions, I mean, in fact, the question that I'm most interested in is, are we alone? Is there life in the universe? Gets to the astrobiology questions. You know, how did life begin? Where else is it? Kind of simple questions like that. Uh, and, and so these are fundamental questions. Uh, uh, I think they're every bit as important as Einstein's. You know, there may be a paper that you know, if we find an intelligent signal or uh, we figure out that life began or how it began, that's a paper that we had sent over as science. So it, it's, it's, it's really a lot of interest in that. Uh, 
Uh, we still have an answer, of course, that you know we don't have the Einstein, you know, uh, unified field theory yet. Uh, not much closer to it. Uh, so there are fundamental physics questions and, uh, and fundamental mathematics questions. It's a tool for everything. But biology is very interesting. Another question is, how does the brain? Uh, I have the slightest idea. Is there anybody else? Uh, I do know that when I have a drink, it works better. <laughs> so, Pete, uh, isn't it uh, Hawking that uh, famously said we shouldn't send a message? So, has he changed his mind, or is he? Uh, is oh, a... No, no, that's a very good question. Absolutely, he's not changed his mind, uh, and that's why we're committed to not sending a message. You, you, you know, this is an interesting. Question. I, I think, that, and we made it very clear that, that uh, in fact, I want to come and talk to Coppola for just this reason, is that, uh, uh, that whether we send a signal or not, if we find something, is a is a decision that humanity has to make. You know, it's not something that a few billionaires or government or one government or something, and it's uh, it warrants a lot of discussion. Fortunately, if we find a signal, it's probably going to be far away and have a little bit of time to think. About. Uh, but uh, uh, and Hawking really agreed with this. You know, this is really carefully considered these things before you send something. But we think the process of people thinking is a species. You know, is a is a, is maybe more than a species. It's, you know, it's a representative life on Earth. Uh, is it will be a useful exercise in, in in bringing people together. So we're really looking for global. Excitement about this. Uh, that's why we thought free food message was a good, a good thing. So I, I really want to emphasize that, that you know we are at this point absolutely not going to try to transmit or you know, because I think that's a uh, but that that's an excellent topic for you know the people of Earth to think about because it's the one thing that we deny all of us. There's a few other things. That's one. You're good straight. Now, right? <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.